Hello everyone and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry, a fan channel where everything Dragalia Lost can be found. This video is my guide to weapons in Dragalia Lost. A lot has changed since I first made a crafting guide last year, so I hope this video serves as an updated resource for those of you who are newer to the game. I'll also include some tips on how to decide what crafting projects to prioritize and how to manage resources for more enfranchised players toward the end of the video. In Dragalia Lost, weapons are one of three types of equipment used to kit out adventurers, alongside worm prints and dragons. Weapons fundamentally differ from worm prints and dragons, however, in that they're mostly linear in power, highly specific in use, and more widely accessible to obtain. Weapons can be crafted by the player directly and leveled up using whetstones, and additional rarities and tiers of weapons can be crafted as the player builds out their halidom and levels up their smithy facility. These factors make weapons the pillar of progression that is most within the player's hands to control and a significant equalizer across players of various levels of spending. Unlike dragons, weapons are not randomly acquired via the summoning system, and unlike worm prints, relevant weapons have never been limited time or locked behind seasonal events. There are crossover and seasonal weapons which are designed to help new players, but in the long run, their main uses are as cosmetic skins. Furthermore, while skills and abilities are the main determinants of how good dragons and worm prints are, weapons are more straightforward and mostly come down to stats, first strength, and less so HP. The flip side is that weapons are also narrow in use limited by weapon type and to a lesser extent by elemental attunement. There's also a small amount of event gating when it comes to crafting, when twinkling sand is required, but most other crafting materials are limited only by players' stamina, wings, and time spent playing the game. This may also apply somewhat to dragon and worm print collections, but the longer you play, the larger your arsenal of weapons will become naturally over time. The other big differentiator between weapons and other types of equipment is that weapons are fundamentally linked to the halidom and quests in ways that worm prints and dragons aren't. Thankfully, the smithy caps at level 9, so once you max it out, that limitation on crafting becomes an afterthought. However, the link between weapons and quests is much more permanent. Because quest drops are necessary to craft weapons of various types, where you choose to spend your stamina, gather wings, honey, and ashes has a large impact on the quality and quantity of weapons you are able to craft. The quests most relevant to crafting include Imperial Onslaught, Void Battles, High Dragon Trials, and the Agito Uprising. While Worm Prints can appear as random drops in quests, this is far from the most common way to acquire them. In contrast, these quests almost always drop relevant weapon crafting materials. Let's start with a roadmap and then I'll get into details on moving from the early game to the end game of weapon crafting. At a high level, what I'd suggest most players do very early on is focus on weaker neutral element weapons while keeping any rarer weapons they obtain as drops or through events. Once Void Battles are unlocked, I'd recommend they pick up any necessary weapons to take on Void Dragons and Void Manticores if needed. From there, I'd advise transitioning to Chimera Tech weapons for the elements where those are available, and collecting the Core and Void High Dragon Bane 5-star elemental weapons otherwise. Finally, for elements where Agito Uprising is available, I'd say it's best to craft 6-star Agito weapons, otherwise High Dragon weapons can be crafted as an alternative to prepare for the eventual Agito fights. Now, let's dive deep into the specifics of each phase of the game, starting with the early game. Very early on, I would suggest worrying less about elemental attunement and focusing more on crafting general purpose neutral element weapons that help your strongest adventurers build might and give your team additional iframe opportunities. One of the most common approaches to powering up is to have one strong unit of each element, 
then slowly work your way toward having an entire team of each element that's strong. Neutral element weapons can be shared across characters of any element while still providing access to any skills or abilities the weapon has. Before clearing Chapter 7 of the main campaign, I'd recommend crafting only neutral element 3 and 4 star weapons with skills and holding on to any rarer weapons you get as drops or from events. These neutral element weapons with a skill are known as tier 2 core weapons, while the elemental ones are tier 3. Tier 1 weapons are neutral element but have no skill at all. The upside to tier 3 core weapons is that when equipped to an adventurer of the matching element, the weapon stats are multiplied by 1.5 times as an attunement bonus. This applies to all elemental weapons, of course. The downside, however, is that the skill on elemental weapons can't be used at all if the equipped adventurer doesn't match the weapon's element. You'll also need materials called insignias from the Imperial Onslaught to craft 4 and 5 star core elemental weapons. It's a good idea to play Imperial Onslaught daily anyway, though, due to its role in building up your dojo facilities. That said, 4-star tier 3 weapons are a pretty good intermediate might booster, but I wouldn't really focus on these for one main reason. Once you clear Chapter 7 of the campaign, you unlock access to Void Battles. This content is central to crafting weapons and stays a staple across the mid-game into the end game. Drops from Void Battles are used to craft Void Weapons, which have passive abilities instead of active skills like the core weapons do. While most Void Weapons won't grant more stats than their core counterparts, Void Weapon abilities are highly specialized for tackling other Void Battles Astral Raids, and even High Dragon Trials. Moreover, Void Weapons eventually culminate in Chimera Tech weapons that completely surpass core weapons in power. These are the weapons crafted by battling Void Chimeras. By focusing on the relevant Void Weapons, you can largely leapfrog the core weapons until they're needed as prerequisites for crafting much, much later on. So once you unlock Void Battles, you'll want 4-star Void Weapons weapons specialized in handling the Void Dragons. For Zephyr, this means Flame Element weapons with Dull Res, crafted using materials from the Steel Golem. For Agni, it's Water Element weapons with Scorching Air Res, crafted using materials from the Obsidian Golem. For Poseidon, it's Wind Element weapons with Skill Res Penetrator, using materials from the Violet Ghost. For Jean d'Arc, it's Shadow Element weapons with Divinity Res Penetrator, crafted using materials from the Frost Hermit Stripe. And finally for Nidhogg, it's Enervation Res Light Element Weapons crafted using materials from the Catoblepas Animos. In Nidhogg's case, these weapons actually scale up to 5 stars. Eventually, when you can craft Chimera Tech or higher power weapons, these specialty void weapons won't be as critical to clearing the void dragon quests. But early on, they're relatively essential to handle each quest's unique gimmicks. Not all weapon types have the right ability to handle each void dragon, and some of these weapons are less important than others. For example, ranged characters in Void Agni prefer Skill Res Penetrator to Scorching Air Res, and healers rarely need special void weapons at all. Poseidon is also an example of a trial that's easy enough without any special weapons. Just try not to cast skills since they do reduce damage. The next tier up from these anti-void dragon weapons are the void weapons that counter astral raids and high dragons. These are natural 5-star weapons with slightly higher stats and special bane abilities which enable them to do 60% more damage against astral raid bosses or 30% more damage against high dragon bosses respectively. The astral bane weapons are crafted using void manticore drops and they also have the slayer strength ability making them good for wave-based content like the facility event challenge battles in the event compendium. The High Dragon Bane Void Weapons, meanwhile, have one general use ability like skill prep or defense and are crafted from Void Dragon Drops. In some ways, these weapons are still stepping stones toward higher power ones because of how niche their use cases are, but for the intermediate term, these weapons will help your teams boost might and empower them to clear harder astral 
and Compendium content, and all standard plus some expert high dragon content. Moreover, crafting these weapons is a prerequisite for crafting Chimera Tech and high dragon weapons. Chimera Tech requires the corresponding Manticore weapon to have been crafted, while High Dragon weapons require both a High Dragon Bane Void weapon and a Core 5 Star Elemental. Chimera Tech weapons also serve as prereqs for Agito weapons, currently the only 6 star weapons in the game. At the time of recording, Chimera Tech weapons are only available for the Shadow and Flame elements, but are expected to expand across all the elements over time. This may mean your Shadow and Flame teams are best suited toward building Might rapidly if you're a newer player, at least for now, and it also can affect the strategy around which higher power weapons you try to craft. For Flame and Shadow, there's a direct route from the Chimera Tech weapons into the Agito weapons. The trial that drops mats for Flame weapons, Volk's Wrath, is fairly challenging on expert difficulty, but demand is high for healers like Loen, for whom a Chimera Tech weapon is sufficient to clear. Meanwhile, the trial that drops mats for Shadow weapons, Kayan, is easier to enter and clear with Chimera Tech weapons, especially as a healer like Cleo or or support unit like Delphi. For the water, light, and wind elements, the strongest weapons available now are high dragon weapons. These high dragon weapons require 5 star void, high dragon bane, and core elemental weapons to craft, but those weapons aren't consumed as part of the crafting process. Since the core elemental weapons at 5 star require twinkling sand as a crafting material, and that's largely gated behind timed events, make sure to only craft the core elemental weapon if you really want to craft the corresponding high dragon weapon, at least early on. Eventually, you'll have enough twinkling sand and rupees to not really worry about this. However, it's still important to consider carefully which Chimera Tech, Aito, and High Dragon weapons you want to craft before doing so, because those weapons cannot be dismantled for materials once they've been created. The actual crafting materials for High Dragon weapons, tails, and horns are dropped from Expert and Master High Dragon trials respectively, and are slower to accumulate than materials for Agito weapons are. For right now, it's likely best to concentrate your efforts on High Mercury, High Jupiter, and High Midgard Sormer because the water, light, and wind elemental weapons crafted using their drops may be useful in future Agito trials or for hard solo content in those elements like the Mercurial Gauntlet. High Jupiter is one of the easiest trials to start with thanks to the availability of good shadow weapons and powerful mana spiral shadow units. High Mercury is also a good starting point at expert difficulty since the fight isn't super technical. It just has a tendency to run long if you're using Void High Dragon Bane weapons for it. I would recommend trying to craft one tier 2 high dragon weapon in each of these elements as a reasonable starting point. It's less important to spread out with a variety of tier 1 high dragon weapons unless you just want the weapon skins, because eventually these will be usurped by Chimera Tech weapons and they're only really effective against the opposite high dragon because of the Bane ability. It's also reasonable to try craft a tier 2 flame weapon if you're having trouble with Volk's Wrath, so I wouldn't rule out battling High Brunhilde for that purpose. High Zodiac is the one High Dragon trial that seems most suspect to grind right now due to the power of Shadow Agito weapons and the relative ease with which those weapons can be obtained and even farmed from Kai Yan. In terms of power, Chimera Tech weapons come in two tiers, High Dragon weapons come in two tiers, and Agito weapons come in one tier, with one or more future tiers set to come down the road. Broadly speaking, Tier 1 Chimera Tech weapons are weaker than Tier 1 High Dragon weapons, Tier 2 Chimera Tech weapons are stronger than that, but weaker than Tier 2 High Dragon weapons, and Agito weapons are stronger than Tier 2 High Dragon weapons when max unbound, but 
usually slightly weaker at zero unbinds. This does vary by element since some have much stronger Agito buff skills. For example, Shadow Agito weapons boost attack rate, providing a much stronger buff than the strength increase granted by Flame Agito weapons. Zooming out a bit, however, one thing that's very clear is that there's a massive jump in power when it comes to Chimera Tech and above versus any other types of weapon in the game. This is perhaps fitting since any weapon at the Chimera Tech level or above is given a special crafting page rather than being lumped together with core weapons or void weapons. The increase in HP is much flatter, although this graphic also demonstrates how weapons skew much more toward providing strength than toward HP. The other helpful point of comparison a chart like this provides is between on-element and off-element. My suggestion as you build out your weapon collection is to try diversify your weapon types across the elements. This will make it easier to mix and match weapon types to create solo teams for things like the Mercurial Gauntlet, because even an off-element tier 2 High Dragon weapon or Agito weapon is strong, especially if it's fully unbound. Tier 1 High Dragon weapons are far less strong and effective when used on off-element units because a large part of their power comes from the element-locked High Dragon Bane ability. The huge leap in power for Chimera Tech or above weapons compared to basic core weapons and other void weapons is a large reason why I commented that weapons mostly come down to stats at the start of this video. The additional strength on these weapons is so far beyond weaker weapons that even if the ability or skill on those weaker alternatives looks more appealing, it's nearly impossible for that to compensate for the thousand or more loss in strength. Weapon Augments, a system introduced last year but never expanded upon, wouldn't be sufficient to make weaker weapons more appealing either. Thus, by the time you unlock Chimera Tech, Agito, and High Dragon weapons, you can largely shelf your earlier arsenal. They'll still stick around as an option if you wish to use them for cosmetic skins. At that point, your main question is how to build out your collection of higher power weapons, which weapon types to craft, elements to focus on, and so on. I already covered this to some extent with our discussion of High Dragon weapons and how not all elements currently have Agito weapons unlocked, but the missing factor that I hadn't mentioned was, of course, personal preference. If you're at a stage where clearing the game's existing content isn't an issue for you, you're free to pursue weapons for adventurers who you may like but aren't especially useful for harder difficulty quests. Another strategy you can take is to try ready yourself for future hard content by amassing a team of each element with tier 2 high dragon weapons or above. Yet another approach is to save and accumulate crafting materials enough so that you can craft a tier 2 high dragon weapon or agito weapon as needed on the fly when the meta shifts because new content or new spirals arrive. All of these decisions are more a matter of preference than of strategy, but purely for from an optimization standpoint, I'd say saving materials makes the most sense once you can already clear or solo clear all content in the game. This also applies to Damascus ingots, which for now should either be saved or only used on tier 2 high dragon weapons. It's seldom worth the grinding needed to manually max unbind those weapons. As for the future, we know Tier 2 Agito weapons are coming eventually, and you never know, we may even get Tier 3 High Dragon weapons. The messaging around which is supposed to be harder, Agito or Master High Dragons, isn't always consistent, leading me to wonder which weapon path will ultimately be stronger when all is said and done. If you want to be prepared for any outcome, then saving materials works. If, on the other hand, you just want to build your favorite units, and I'm definitely in this camp, that can also provide a lot of intermediate fun and enjoyment as well. Accumulating crafting materials for weapons by repeatedly playing the same quests may not be the most exciting part of Dragalia Lost for some players. Others may love the sense of steady progression. Wherever you fall, I hope you found this video helpful. Ultimately, players have a lot of control over what they do and how much power they amass in this game. And it all comes down to the quests you play, the weapons you craft, and the time you decide to put in. 
Are there any other thoughts or ideas around weapons and crafting in Dragalia Lost that I missed in this video? If so, definitely let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, everyone, thank you so much for watching, take care, and I'll see you next time.